is the day that God has made. We will rejoice and be glad. This is the day that God has made. We will rejoice and be glad. Singing Grace and peace to you on this second Sunday of the season of Easter, April the 11th, 2021. Betty Ann is not with me today because uh, she's having a well-deserved week off. So we'll do the service the best we can without her. Welcome to this virtual worship of the Broadview United Bridge Service, where people from all walks of life can find a bridge to understanding and a bridge to acceptance and to common connection. So in all parts of our lives, in whatever circumstances we find ourselves in, we want to say here clearly, there is always a bridge which connects us to a loving spirit God and to a person who's really an angel in disguise. So reach out, talk to us, connect. We'd love to get to know you, and we'd love to reach out our hand and form a bridge with you. Our service today begins with the territorial acknowledgement we begin all our services and activities with this acknowledgement because we want to say that we realize and we recognize every day that we are gathered on the unceded territories of the Coast Salish people. Here, we live and work, worship and play. We also seek a new relationship with the Lekwungen people, with the Squamalt people, and the Songhe and Wasanic nations. We want this new relationship to be one that's based in respect and in a desire to fulfill the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and to make a bridge in which we walk both ways between our peoples. May it be so, and may we work to make it so. Our candles today, and we have the four direction candles, which, um, which are uh, in the colors of the First Nations colors, red and black and yellow and white, and we light them as our four direction candles to remind us and to acknowledge that we live in a global world that has many nations, it has many peoples, and it's our desire to build a connection of understanding and friendship amongst all these peoples of the world and to see that we are part of them 
and they are part of us. And then also on this first Sunday after Easter, we light the candle of the spirit of the resurrected Christ who is in our midst, who is for us a source of light and hope and who kindles out of our hearts a warmth and a desire to be a loving presence. So we gather around the light as we begin our worship today. Now, friends, take a deep breath. Let it out. Again, a deep breath and let it out. Release anything that's holding you back from worship. Let's ready our spirits to worship God. Let's calm our minds, center our hearts, quiet our hands. Let's think of the diverse friends that we have who are near and far, who are familiar to us, and some who are unknown to us and we're still waiting to get to know each other. Let's breathe into the beauty of this time and space. Let's lend our voices to prayer. Let's sing songs of hope. Let's support each other and ground ourselves in the Spirit's peace. And so let's gather with our singing group in singing our first hymn, Sing a Happy Hallelujah. Friends, open your hearts with mine in prayer. Through our hymns and our songs, our prayers and our meditations, the joining of our lives in this virtual community, we worship you, O oh gracious and loving God. Enfold us in your universal love. 
empower us to realize that your presence is in us and around us. It's between us and amongst us. Help us, O oh God, to love and serve you every day in all the ways that we can. God, hear our prayer and kindle our light. Amen. Friends, we have a long scripture reading today, and um, if you want to, take this moment to go and get your Bible and uh, bring it back with you. Uh, you can follow along as I read from John 21. And uh, then we're going to have, uh, instead of really a sermon, we're going to have uh, a little uh, scripture study on this passage. So get your Bible if you have one or open it in the app on your phone. I'm sure all of you have an app, of uh, the Bible app on your phone. And uh, follow along. John 21. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he showed himself in this way. Gathered together there were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana, in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, of course, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peters said to the others, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, We will go with you. And they went out and got into the boat. But that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples didn't know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, Friends, you have no fish, have you? <laughs> and they answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net to the right side of the boat, and you will find some. And so they cast it, and now they were not able to haul in it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord. And then Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, and when he heard that, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and he jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they got ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you caught just now, so Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, about 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? because they knew it was the Lord. And Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. And this was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. A second time Jesus said to Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, 
you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed your sheep. Very truly, I tell you, that when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and go to wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hand and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. After this, he said to him, follow me. Hi, everyone. Thanks for uh, tuning in today. And uh, we're going to have a little uh, Bible study or a real look uh, at some of this, uh, this passage uh, in what biblical scholars might see in this passage. And uh, it's just a different way of uh, thinking about it. You know, this is typically called uh, Slow Sunday, uh, the Sunday after Easter. Uh, you, there's been such a big uh, festival with Easter and uh, so many services and that. Uh, so the week after is typically a slow Sunday. And uh, I propose that rather than make it a slow Sunday, that we look at it as an in-depth uh, discussion about uh, Scripture. So I'm using uh, the student Bible, uh, a study Bible that I got uh, during one of the confirmation classes. I put the tabs on myself. I recommend that everybody do that if you, uh, when you get a Bible, um, you put the tabs on. Because if you're like me, you just forget what, uh, some of the sur uh, what some of the books are, and certainly you don't remember their order. So uh, our passage today, if you're following along, is from John chapter 21. Now, I want to say a few things about uh, the Gospel of John. John is written uh, probably around a uh, hundred years in the common era, maybe even a little bit later. He's the very latest of all the Gospels. And so many of the traditions of the post-resurrection church had been well established because it's uh, about a hundred years since Jesus was born, but it's uh, 70 years since the resurrection of Jesus happened. And that early community has been busy for 70 years trying to put words to what they experienced. So now, remembering that, uh, that this is uh, the Gospel of John, written later, we see in this chapter that there's really three excellent stories um, four, if you found, count the opening vignette, that uh, belong with the traditions of the resurrected Jesus. Let's look at the beginning one. In the first uh, three verses, we see that uh, the disciples are gathered together. They're Kind of, it sounds like they're just drifting, but they're gathered there by the sea. And Simon Peter says, I'm going to go fishing. And all the other disciples that are with him say, we'll come too. And so they get in the boat. But that night, they caught nothing. Let's look at these little, that little vignette. What the Gospel of John and what scholars have seen in that passage 
is that the earliest church is calling Peter into leadership. It's he who has the idea. He knows what he's going to do. He's going to go fishing. And the others follow him. In that early church, Peter would be one of the significant leaders. But here, in these early verses, you'll see that he's calling the other disciples to go fishing. Now, that's what Peter used to do before the time of Jesus. He was a fisherman. And so, this passage is kind of saying, in, uh, since the death of Jesus, he tried to go back to what life was like before Jesus called him away from being a fisherman and made him one of the disciples. He's trying to go back. And we get a hint of how that's going to work out because they say, it's night, and they caught nothing. <sighs> when you hear that it's night in Scripture, people who study this good book say they know that whatever's happening, mm, it's not going to work out. Um, and it sounds like uh, Peter is in the dark about uh, what to do. But he can't go back. That yields nothing. I was thinking about that passage when I thought about COVID-19. You know, many people are getting their vaccinations and uh, even though our numbers are going up, we have this sense of hopefulness uh, for the summer. And I've talked to many people and we're saying um, we'd love to get things back to normal. But I wonder, can we ever go back to what was the old normal, normal the pre-COVID normal? Because we're different now. We've changed and our world has changed. It's going to be interesting to see how it changes. There, good catch of the word, I think. Let's go on. Jesus uh, says, verse 4 says, just after daybreak. So now scripture scholars that we're becoming, daybreak. There's going to be new light on the subject. And Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples didn't know that it was Jesus. And he says, friends, you have no fish. Uh, so really, they think they're talking to a stranger. And he sees their situation. And they say, no, he doesn't. And he says, cast your net on the other side of the boat and uh, you'll find some. And so they take the advice of the stranger and they do it and it yields tremendous results. And then what happens is very interesting because it is the disciple whom Jesus loved. That's how he's referred to. It's uh, probably John. He says to Peter, it is the Lord. John is the one who recognizes Jesus. And as soon as he recognizes that and says it to Simon Peter, Simon Peter, we're told uh, he was naked, but he threw on some clothes and immediately jumped into the sea. 
and went to Jesus. Now I have to tell you that that's an important interaction because without John's recognition of Jesus in the stranger, Peter would not have acted any differently. But it is as John recognizes the presence of the resurrected Lord, it is at that moment that Peter flies into action. There have been thousands upon thousands sermons that have looked at that interaction between John and Peter. And they have said, we can build the church on that interaction. Because the faith of people needs to be twofold, needs to be built on two, two foci. One, that people recognize the risen Christ in the stranger. And two, that having recognized, they take action. On these two temperaments of John, the more reflective, the more insightful, the more thoughtful person who recognizes and sees on his character and on the character of Simon Peter, the man of action. It's that interaction that our faith has been built on. And since the very beginning, people have, scholars have looked at that interaction and have said, that is key to the development of our faith. We cannot act without recognizing for whom we are acting. But to just recognize for whom we are looking to recognize the risen Christ and do nothing is equally impossible. So this interaction is key. Now, there's another item in this, which I've often wondered about, and maybe you have too. So Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, and he put on some clothes for he was naked, and he jumped into the sea. It does make a person ponder. What were the other disciples wearing? Was everybody naked? Or was it only Simon Peter? But his response... He put on some clothes and he jumped into the sea. What do you think it means? Well, each of the gospel writers refers back to uh, some part of the uh, Hebrew Bible. Um, Luke looks back to uh, the prophets and their justice statements and quotes them freely. Matthew looks back to the suffering servant passages of Isaiah. John looks back to the book of Genesis. And right when he begins his book, he makes a new, he reinterprets the story of Genesis. In the beginning was the Word. 
He's doing it again, uh, scholars think, in this passage. Peter is naked. And then he jumps up, puts on clothes, jumps into the sea and swims to Jesus. In Genesis uh, chapter 3, Adam has come to the awareness that he is naked. And so when God comes into the Garden of Eden at that time, Adam is ashamed of his nakedness and he goes and he hides. In the story of Jesus, as the Gospel of John presents it, it is no longer necessary that when someone is naked or needy, ashamed, it is no longer necessary that they would hide away. Now, with the risen Christ and in this community, those who are naked and needy and ashamed, they'll just do whatever it takes, throw on some clothes, do whatever it takes, and get to Jesus as quickly as possible. Because in Jesus, everyone is able to approach him. His love, his grace, receives the naked, the needy, the worried, the burdened. There's nothing to fear. There's no need for shame. Throw on some clothes, jump into the sea, and come to the shore where Jesus is because you will be received. This is a lovely, important teaching that comes out of just those few verses once we know how to read them. So then they have uh, the barbecue on the shore. They have bread and fish. And... They have breakfast together. And all the disciples know that they're in the presence of Jesus. But he doesn't look like Jesus. He doesn't seem to be a physicalness, a physicalness that they recognize. So they don't ask him, who are you? Because they know but he isn't physically recognizable to them. But they have an essential spiritual connection that gives them the certainty that this man, this stranger, is the embodiment of the love and grace of the risen Christ. After they've had breakfast, Jesus says to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus asks him three times. Now, some people say that that harkens back to Peter's denial, where three times he said, no, I don't know that man. Um, and perhaps it does. It would make an excellent sermon, wouldn't it? Certainly you hear the resonance of that. Three times denial, three times, do you love me? It may be that uh, Jesus asks them three times. Uh, remember that quote not too long ago in uh, one of our Friday emails about, from Richard Wagamese who said, uh, 
Uh, you ask people three times because the first time uh, it is our head that answers quickly. Uh, the second time we're asked uh, the same question, uh, it is our heart which answers and we get an emotional answer. Uh, the third time we encounter the same question, you get a whole body answer to the question because it's a deeper response that comes. And so maybe asking three times, will feed my sheep? Uh, maybe that's because he wants the deep answer. But it may also be if we circle around to right at the beginning where the disciples and uh, Peter is being tested or is being called into leadership, it might be that at this conclusion where Jesus says, feed my sheep, feed my lambs, it may be that this stranger, this resurrected Christ, is a calling Peter to follow him in being the good shepherd. The good shepherd who is the leader of the sheep. The good shepherd who knows his sheep and whose sheep know him. In this passage, scholars say that what is being asked of Peter is not about the three times, but it is about feed my sheep. Peter, are you willing to be the good shepherd who will walk before the people, who will walk in the midst of the community, who will act in ways of love and integrity and authenticity that will be recognized by the early community. Will you be the spirit, the personification of the risen Christ, the good shepherd? And will you give that you're all. That's the question that's being asked of Peter. Is he willing to be the leader who will be the good shepherd, who will protect his community and his people even unto his death? Well, that's just a little bit of Bible study that I wanted to do today. I hope you found it interesting. I hope you found something that resonates with your heart. I hope it's had the effect of releasing you from anything that stands between you and being embraced by the love of God. Well, thank you for listening. Amen. the dishes and put them away. I've told you a story, tucked you in tight at the end of your knockabout day. 
As the moon sets its sails to carry you to sleep over the midnight sea, I will sing you a song no one sang to. Friends, I want to thank everyone for the offering that you gave over the Easter weekend. It was very, very welcome. And I can say at this point that uh, so far as I've been told, Jesus is winning, um, is winning the number of votes uh, for people who think that we should have more jokes in, in church. So thanks for... Uh, responding to the fun way of, uh, of uh, inviting your offering. And uh, just know we are very, very grateful uh, in these difficult times that you uh, continue to support the work of this church. Would you open your hearts with mine now in prayer? God of Christmas and of Easter, and of all the days in between. We thank you for not only telling us, 
but showing us how very much you love us. You even went so far as to be born into our world as one of us. To, you lived amongst us. You walked beside us, healing us, teaching us, sharing our suffering, being part of the journey of life and of death and of life beyond death. In this season of resurrection, thank you that as your church, your gathered community on earth, we are given the important work of bearing witness to your love, of sharing your love, of doing things that inspire beauty and courage and goodness and hope. It is important work you have called us to, gracious God, and we give you thanks for your trust in confidence in us. We give you thanks that part of our work is to comfort those who are hurting and to challenge those who are complacent Thank you that your love walks into the places of turmoil and terror in our world. So we pray for the people of the world who are affected by poverty and the effects of greed. We pray especially and remember our refugee family who, for whom we are waiting and watching and wondering, keep them safe, and bring them to their new home and into our welcoming arms. We pray for people the world over who are affected by this darn pandemic. We hardly know what to do, except to do the very simple things that we know help ourselves and each other to be safe. Give us resoluteness to continue to wear our masks, wash our hands, keep a physical distance from others, even when we're almost mad to have a hug. Gracious God, we pray for your work, for your earth, which is groaning under the pollution and the lack of concentrated care that we give it. But we give you thanks for all those people who are trying new ways to care for the earth. We give you thanks for the younger generation who has taken it as their call to preserve and protect our earthly home. Empower all of us who live at this time in history to find your ways of renewing this world and to be part of applying the solutions that are needed and discovered. We rejoice, gracious God, that you gather and hold us in your wide, warm, compassionate embrace and that you claim us by name as your beloved children. Be with those amongst us and those we know who are suffering this day. Comfort and support those who are afraid Accompany the lonely back into relationship. Sit beside the dying, holding their hands, and lead them home. Empower those who are differently abled to find the places where their skills are valued and appreciated. God, in your love, hear our prayers 
and hear us as we sing a version of your prayer. Amen. Now what wonderful music we've had during this service and I want to thank all the musicians who came in and who make this service uh, lively and bright and lovely as it is. I want to thank Shane who's uh, back there uh, making this recording into something that is beautiful to watch. I want to thank you for tuning in and for engaging in this worship time. May God bless you. And I'm using as the benediction today a paraphrase of a very, very old blessing. And so, this week, may God be in our heads and in our thinking. May God be in our eyes and in our looking. God be in our mouth and in our speaking. 
God, be in our heart and in our understanding. God, be in our hands and in our helping. God, be in our feet and in our showing up. God, be in our attitude and in our encouraging of one another today and every day. Amen. May it be so. I'm gonna shout, shout, shout out my love for Jesus, for Jesus. I'm gonna shout, shout, shout out my love for God's most holy child. For whatever I might do today at home, at school, at work, at play, I got Jesus' love deep down inside. Jesus, for Jesus, I'm gonna dance.